Good evening. We have a very substantial area to cover this evening, two main areas, and we're going to have to uh, fly right along. I hope you'll be able to keep up uh, with uh, my rather hurried pace. I'm sorry about that. But I would like to begin this evening by reading a few sections from 1 Corinthians, first of all in chapter 11, and then in chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 11. The apostle at the end of the chap uh, previous chapter has said, do all to the glory of God. And now he begins to explain one of the ways in which God may be glorified in the life of the people of God. Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered." For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power or authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord." For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. That is no other practice. And then he goes on to uh, part two of the chapter. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. And he goes on to speak about a second uh, delivery, if you will. You'll notice the word in verse two, I delivered unto you. Uh, Paradidomai is the word, and uh, the same word is used again in verse 23, uh, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. It is a transmission, the passing on of something that he had received from the Lord. And so you see the kind of parallel here in the chapter. The first part, I praise you, brethren. The second part, I praise you not. And so there's, a, there's a, obviously a, a parallel between the two halves of the chapter. Now we go over to chapter 14, please. And there are various exhortations in the chapter regarding the appropriate and inappropriate exercise of gift in the church, says the apostle in verse 26 of chapter 14, at the end of the verse, let all things be done unto edifying. And then uh, we have a little further down, uh, verse 29, let the prophet speak two or three and let the others judge. And then... Verse 34, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, that is the common word for men there, used 15 times in the chapter, for men in home order, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What, came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandment of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant 
Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, forbid not to speak with tongues, let all things be done decently and in order, or according to the order. This is the word that is used, the word tax is used, of the fixed succession of the priestly course. We have it in Luke chapter 1 and verse 8. And again, the words in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 5, joying and beholding your order. So here we have now a, a very important subject, a subject that has certainly in many quarters uh, provided more heat than light. And I hope that this evening um, we will have a happy and helpful discussion of the subject. I think it's very, very helpful to us to understand that as we read through the Word of God, there are many characters throughout the Bible who suddenly are taken and thrown up on the big screen, and we discover that Abraham is not simply a, a biographical sketch of a man, but we discover in the New Testament that Abraham now is being used to teach us some lessons. He is, as it were, a character playing a part. We find it with David, we find it with Hagar and Sarah and hundreds of other characters throughout the Bible. We suddenly discover that while they have their own personal individual lives, they got up in the morning and had their breakfast and, and went out into the day, what they perhaps didn't understand always was that someday God was going to take these events of their lives and throw them up on the screen for us and they happened for our examples. Now, in a similar way, we discover that the church of the present time is also being used as an object lesson. Sometimes the Sunday school teacher will put up the flannel graph and say to the children, be like Daniel. Or may put up another one and say, don't be like Samson, right? And so some, some are good examples, some are bad examples. And the church has been called also to be a kind of message, a larger message than what we personally sometimes understand. By the church, says Paul to the Ephesians, God is making known his manifold wisdom to the unseen hosts of heaven. So that in the same way that these Old Testament characters played parts, and we see Adam and Eve playing parts, not simply their own personal lives, but we discover that they are a picture to us of something much bigger. In the same way, we in our little lives, we don't often think of it when we're going to pick up the laundry or cutting the grass, but in our lives, we are also playing a part. And we see this very clearly explained to us in passages like Ephesians 5 and also here in 1 Corinthians 11 that the men have been called on to play a part. And that part is the part of Christ. It's a very, very solemn thing, both in the home and in the church. In the home, Ephesians chapter 5 tells us that the man is to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. He couldn't have said it any stronger, could he? Wherever we got the idea that the man was Lord over his wife, we have missed the point significantly, haven't we? Because the Lord Jesus served the church. We don't have to guess how he did it. The scripture tells us how. As Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And so the man is to be a servant in the relationship. Any woman will find it much easier to submit to her husband if her husband is the servant in the relationship. That's the idea, isn't it? In the same way, in the church, we see that there is a very specific order established. And once again, the woman plays the part of the bride and the man plays the part of the groom. Now this idea begins in Genesis and concludes in Revelation and all the way through scripture we have this, this love story always just below the surface, don't we? And we can't help but read even the little book of Ruth or the book of Esther 
or to read uh, the stories of, of many of these uh, patriarchs of old without catching a glimpse of this idea of the bridegroom seeking a bride and wooing the bride and uh, these great bridegroom stories throughout the Bible have their consummation in that glorious day in Revelation chapter 19, the chapter of the New Testament in which all the hallelujahs in the New Testament are found. It must be quite a day. The day of the bride and the groom. The, the, the bridegroom, the heavenly bridegroom, the lamb's wife at last has made herself ready and the bridegroom presents his bride. So this helps us a great deal if we can put these glasses on when we read a passage like this and we read these words, for example, which may great on the sisters when they first read it. The man was not made for the woman. The woman was made for the man. It's a bit of an irritation, isn't it? Well, let me translate it for you then. The the Lord Jesus was not made for the church, but the church was made for the Lord Jesus. That's really what's being said here. That's the big picture. And so when God created Adam and Eve, he could have done it any way he liked. But he made them one creative act. He took something out of Adam. He took some of his life. And the scripture says that Adam's first love song to his wife went like this. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha, for she was taken out of Ish. That's the idea, you see. And so this is exactly where we are today. We too are the bride of the wounded side. And we have actually become bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. We are the body of Christ, and we share his life. We are not an independent creation. We have, as it were, been brought out of him. Now, the apostle goes on, and he makes it clear that while the man is not uh, out of the woman, verse 8 of chapter 11, the woman is out of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. This again is, throw it on the big screen, ladies and gentlemen. The idea being, Christ is not in heaven to do our will. We are on earth to do his will. He wasn't made for us. We were made for him. We don't expect him to live for our pleasure we are to live for his pleasure. For his pleasure, we are and were created. So if we can just get that picture in our mind, that's the story. He goes on to say in verse 11, Nevertheless, neither is the woman without the man, nor the, uh, neither the woman, pardon me, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, all right, in other words, Eve was out of Adam. Even so is the man also by the woman. In other words, ever since the first woman came out of a man, every man has come out of a woman. We're in this thing together, he says. We need each other. There's no issue here of superiority, inferiority. So when we think about the order, as we have it described here, relative to headship, Let's remember what's being said. The Lord has, by his spirit, made sure in verse 3 that we read this. The head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. The head of Christ is God. It is not in either um, decreasing or increasing order here. It, it's, it's put in such a way that in case the woman is offended by the words, the head of the woman is the man, immediately the Spirit of God reminds us that the head of Christ is God. Now, Christ is God. There's no superiority, inferiority here at all, is there? So this is church order, and I, I would strongly suggest that the first half of chapter 11 is linked with the second half of chapter 11, the phrases, I praise you and praise you not, the use of the words ordinances and delivered 
are found in both halves, and at the pivot are these words, if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no other custom, neither the churches of God. Remember, uh, as we say in the notes here, that the Corinthian, 1 Corinthians is the only epistle which is addressed not only to the assembly who received it, but to all that in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus. As if the Spirit of God anticipated that someday somebody might say, well, wait a minute, that's just to Corinth. And the Spirit of God says, no, it isn't. It's to all that in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus. And then we read those solemn words at the end of chapter 14, where the Apostle Paul says, do you think you're a prophet? Do you think you know the word of God? Do you think, are you, do you think you're wise? Then acknowledge this, that these are the commandment of the Lord. It's important for us to see that. In fact, he issues what may appear to be a curse. If anyone will be ignorant, let him be ignorant. It's similar to those words in the book of the Revelation. Uh, him that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And so here he says, if you're determined to be ignorant, you'll be locked into this. If you consciously turn from this truth, the danger is that you will be ignorant. You will choose that ignorance and willful ignorance has no solution. So it's a solemn thing. When we're looking at this passage, people who say, well, this is not very important, well, it has to do with the glory of God. You know, many creeds include these words that the chief end of man is to glorify God. If the chief end of man is to glorify God, then surely a passage that deals with the glory of God is not unimportant, is it? It's a very significant passage. So he's going to tell us here that the order is significant. And if you turn to page 33, you will see what looks like, um, well, it looks like I did something in the middle of the night, and I hope you can make some sense of it. <laughs> the personal life, the civic life, the family life, and local church life. Four little grass schemes that suggest, first of all, that in the life of the Christian, there is divine order. And that divine order is, if you'll look at the solid lines coming down, you can write on those authority. And the broken lines going back up, you can write accountability. And so the Lordship of Christ, the ministry of the Spirit, and the revelation of the Word of God have primacy in my life. Personally, I am accountable to the Lord Jesus, to the Holy Spirit, and to the Word of God to obey, to trust and obey. And this is a matter of personal submission and obedience. A husband can't do this for his wife, nor a wife for her husband. Parents can't do it for children, children for parents. Every one of us will give account of ourselves to God. Every one of us needs to yield to the Lordship of Christ, to the gracious ministry of the Holy Spirit, and to the truth of God's word. Each of us, and no one can do it for anyone else. So at this point, personal order, it's simply this. Christ, through his word, by his spirit, speaks to my heart, and I personally am responsible to respond. That's personal life. Then secondly, civic life. You have it in Romans 13 and Ephesians 6 and 2 Corinthians 4. And here we see that the child of God is in the world but not of it, is expected, first of all, to submit to employers, secondly, to government, and thirdly, to have a relationship with unbelievers. And those are all clearly laid out for us in Scripture. As far as government's concerned, we're to pay, pray, and obey. To pay our taxes, to obey the laws of the land, and to pray for those in authority. As far as employers are concerned, it's clearly laid out in Scripture. My responsibility to my employer or my employees and my relationship to the lost. I'm to do good to them as I have opportunity. I'm to have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness, but I am to shine, I am to testify to those unbelievers who are around me. And so in my civic life, 
Um, this is all clearly laid out in the word of God, isn't it? Then we come to family life. And we see that as we read through the Bible, perhaps to our surprise, we will not find one perfect family. Every family is dysfunctional in the Bible, <laughs> except Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are only three relationships in the family. There is the, the relationship between the father and his children, the parent-child relationship, which is mirrored in the father's relationship to us as children. There is the husband-wife relationship, which is mirrored for us in Christ and his relationship to the church. And there is the brother-sister relationship, which is mirrored for us in the bond of the spirit, which links us together. And so these three, the, this is the perfect family. The little families we have down here are pale imitations of the true heavenly family into which we have been welcomed through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the relationships are clear there. You'll notice that I put the wife and husband uh, on the same level because the scripture teaches us that we are heirs together of the grace of life and that there is to be mutual submission to each other. Now, the husband is responsible for his wife and he is the head of the home. Whether he's saved or not, he's the head of the home. These little plaques that say Christ is the head of this home, well, it's, it's a lovely sentiment. It's not true. <laughs> the, the Christ is the head of the church, but the husband is the head of the home, and God holds him responsible. We notice in Scripture very carefully that the father is responsible for the children. Now, the children are expected to obey the parents, but when it speaks the other direction, the father is to take responsibility in the home. The, we'll see a little later on that the mother is the keeper of the home. But the father is responsible to establish godly order in the home. He is expected to be the one who will give an account someday for the children. And so he needs to take that seriously. Sometimes husbands just leave it to their wives to raise the children it is an ungodly order. The order is that the, the father, the husband, is to take responsibility for the children, but the children are not only to obey the father. The father is to step in and say, that's your mother. You respect your mother and you obey your mother. She and I speak together. We agree and you obey mother. And that's, that's a responsibility. Very often the children will respond to the voice of the father before they'll respond to the voice of the mother. And the children have to learn that mother speaks on behalf of husband, wife, and that we speak the same thing. We're united in raising children. So again, this is all laid out for us in scripture, and uh, it's, it's quite clearly given. Then we come to local church life. And in, in local church life, we notice uh, the elders care for each other. They give an account to one another. And if there's an unruly elder, it's not the flock that should deal with it. The elders should deal with an unruly elder. The elders then uh, take care of the flock, and those who are in their local church care are expected to obey, to know, to pray for, to encourage, and many other such words, the elders. Now we notice that the Lord has, shall we say, an independent uh, connection with all of his people so that even though the elders may fail, the Lord doesn't fail. He is able to minister to our souls. We go out to a meeting, and unfortunately the ministry is less than adequate. If we go out to hear the voice of the Lord, he'll still speak to us. He can use the verse of a hymn or the text hanging on the wall. He can do anything he likes. He will not turn us away hungry if we come looking for his truth. Even though men fail, God doesn't fail. And so the Lord is able to minister individually to the people in the, in the church. Um, but the way he loves to do it is through his servants, through the elders, as they care for the flock. So the order, again, is clear. The Lord of the churches, the elders of the local church, and the flock working together, encouraging each other, mutual submission to one another, and submitting to the elders who then submit to the Lord of the churches, the chief shepherd himself. Now we come to this issue of understanding order, page 36. And uh, let me say that uh, we're going to have to go rather quickly through this. 
I have spoken in Northern Ireland on the subject before, on the subject of headship and glory and the head covering, and if you'd like a tape on that subject which deals with it very comprehensively, you can sign up over at the book table a little later on to get that tape if you're interested. But I'd like to point out a few things very briefly here. Um, very often people will ask, okay, I understand this idea of uh, submission, uh, the women are to be silent and so on. The question is when? That's the big issue, isn't it? When is the head covering to be in place? When are the women to be silent in the churches? Well, we've noted on other evenings that the silence of the women is not in some, some sort of blanket silence, is it? Because the women are free to sing congregationally. They're free to say amen at the end of a prayer. Why are they free to do that? Because they're acting as priests, as individual priests, and they are free to do that. They're free to pray to God from their hearts as much as they like. There's no restriction whatsoever. What is the restriction? Well, the restriction is that they are not to act representatively. They're not to act as a representative, either of the assembly to God or of God to the assembly. You'll notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 7 we read, the man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. The word image there is a word we're familiar with if we have a computer. It's the word icon. It's the icon represents something in the computer. It re represents um, a, a document or a file or a program. It's an icon. And this is the idea that the man represents the Lord in the local assembly. He's not the Lord, but he represents the Lord. This is a different word than the Hebrew word that's used in the creation story where God said, let us make man in our image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God called their name Adam. You ever wonder why the women take the names of their husbands? Well, there it is. God called their name Adam. He saw them as one creative act sharing a common life. Two are made one. So in that instance, the word image has to do with likeness, with, with moral likeness. God gave man the kind of com composition so that man could have fellowship with God. And the man and the woman share this composition, spirit, soul, and body. We have the equipment, if you will, to fellowship with God. That's what's being referred to there. And man and woman equally were made in the image of God in that Hebrew sense. But here, it's a different word. It means that the man is the representative of God. And he is the glory of God. Now, what does this mean? Well, glory is the outward expression of inward nature. No one sees God. No one can see God. But we can see the glory of God. No one can see the sun. With the naked eye, you look at it, you don't see the sun. You see the glory of the sun. You see the outshining of the sun, and the rays that come from the sun tell you something about the nature of the sun. And so it is with God. God has manifested himself in the church, revealing himself through the man. Now, it's not the man's personality, uh, his uh, clever wit. <laughs> it's that the man speaks the word of God. It's that the man speaks represents God, speaking as the oracles of God, and he also represents the church. So praying and prophesying, I take it in this passage, are used in their widest sense. Praying is anything that we say to God. It includes intercession, supplication, praise, worship, thanksgiving. And, and um, prophesying is anything that God says to us. In the next chapter, he defines it as anything that is to edification, exhortation, and comfort. So it's being used in the widest sense. The man represents God to the assembly when we open his word and we speak his mind as the oracles of God. Likewise, when the man represents the assembly in prayer, he comes to God in prayer, 
and he represents the assembly, says Paul, be careful how you pray so everyone can say amen. It's their prayer too. You represent the whole assembly when you stand to pray. And that's why we pray in the plural. We don't say, I thank you for this and that. We say we, because we're praying for the whole assembly. Are we all together yet? Good. So the man is the glory of God. What does that mean? It means this, that man was what he was. Now this is symbolic. Let's remember that. This is symbolic. Man was what he was because of what came out of God. Man was made of the dust of the ground, but he wasn't a living soul until God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So man was what he was because of what came out of God, different than all the other creatures. The woman was what she was because of what came out of man. It was a different thing, wasn't it? A different order. And the purpose is this, to show us on the grand scale that the Lord Jesus is God manifest in flesh and he has given his life for us and we share that life. And we are to represent, we are to reveal, the church is to reveal Christ in the world. So this, this order is put up on the big screen here and we see Adam and Eve, a picture of Christ in the church, now represented in the church by the man and a woman. This is not husband-wife order. It is man-woman order. Any and every man is ahead of any and every woman in the church in the same way that any and every name beginning with the letter A is in the phone book ahead of my name, Nicholson. If, if I get my phone book and say, there it is again, I'm on page 627, I hate this, and I call up the phone company and I say, I demand that you put me on page one. And they say, sir, look, we love the N's just as much as we love the A's, but you know, this is called alphabetical order. I hope you're not offended. The A's are not more important than the N's. It's just that if we're ever going to find a phone number, there has to be order. It's called alphabetical order. We have numerical order, we have chronological order, and we have church order. It has nothing to do with importance. We see that because Christ, we read, the head of Christ is God. It has nothing to do with significance, importance, value. It has to do with order, period. All right? So if we can get a hold of that, that in order for God to accomplish his purposes, Christ was willing to submit himself to God. The man is to be willing to submit himself to Christ. And the woman is to be willing to submit herself to the man in church order. Again, it has nothing to do with husband-wife relationship. When we get to, first, uh, to Ephesians chapter 5, we'll see it's put, shall we say, in parallel rather than in series. In 1 Corinthians 11, it's Christ, the man, the woman. But in Ephesians 4, uh, Ephesians 5, it's Christ in his relationship to the church is the same as the man in his relationship to the woman. You see the difference? That's home order, where the husband is the head as Christ is the head. But here, it's that Christ is the head of the man and the man is the head of the woman. And in the same way that Christ willingly submitted himself to God in order to accomplish the purposes and glorify God on the earth, as he said in John 17, so the man is to submit to Christ to glorify God on the earth by speaking the very word of God, not his own words, by praying in a way that is honoring to God, not his own thoughts, not his own way, but coming to God and then bringing the word of God to the people of God, acting as his representative. In the same way, says the scripture, the woman is the glory of the man. Now it's a beautiful thing, isn't it, when we see the picture. The king's daughter is all glorious within. The church is beautiful. It doesn't look beautiful on the outside. Just like the tabernacle of old, it looked like a hump in the desert. There was nothing beautiful. 
about the, the tabernacle on the old outside. It, the beauty was seen when you got inside. And so it is with the church. The church isn't very attractive on the outside, but inside there is a glory because the Lord is there. The Lord has moved into the church and has taken up his residence. The only place that the Lord feels at home on earth is in the hearts of his people. It's in the assembly of the saints. So when we think of this order, we recognize God's design and we submit happily to it. And um, the little scheme at the top of page 37 suggests these two themes, these two ideas of headship and glory. And you'll notice that uh, relative to headship, the woman's hair is not mentioned. And relative to glory, God is not mentioned. Uh, as far as glory is concerned, the man is the glory of Christ. The woman is the glory of the man. Uh, the, her hair is her own glory. Pardon me, that arrow should go up to be the glory of God. Christ is not mentioned there. Then you have on the other side, headship. Uh, we have this principle of uh, the woman's head is the man, the man's head is Christ, the, head's, the head of Christ is God. So we think about this issue now, when is it appropriate? And if we go back in our minds to pages 34 and 35, we think about order. And I've given a few illustrations here in, chapter, in, in uh, page 36, the first section, relative to this matter of order and how does it work. So if I go to a little group of Christians who are meeting in a house, the geography, the real estate does not matter, ladies and gentlemen, if we could get that in our head. Because you're meeting in a church building does not make it church order. You can have a blood donor clinic in a church building. That's world order. You can have a, a marriage in a church building. That's family order. Marriages are not church order. In the Catholic Church, they are. But uh, we don't believe that marriage is a sacrament of the church. It's family order. And the family could just as well decide to have the wedding out in a garden somewhere. It's, it's not church order. A funeral is not church order. Do I see some of these? No, it's not. The, 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 the funeral is family order. And you can have the funeral in a funeral home. You could have it by the graveside. All of this sort of the way we do funerals is very much a cultural thing. You go to other places and they have it very different. In Israel, you've got to bury the person within 24 hours. There's no special celebration or ceremony or, or uh, um, activities. They, they, it's a very simple thing. So the idea that because it's in the church building, that makes it church order. Well, in the New Testament days, they didn't have church buildings, did they? They, they met in homes. They met on the steps of the synagogue. They met all sorts of places. And as I've said before, maybe if we had a little dose of persecution and we were driven out of our church buildings, and well, what would you do? call it? The gospel hall meeting in the forest? Or, you see, the building now is non-essential. The, the building is not, does not determine church order. There are, there are true New Testament churches in many places around the world, in China today, in many other countries. If you went to Saudi Arabia, you could not have a church building. You'd meet in a house, usually an insulated house. You'd park some distance, and in twos and threes, you'd make your way quietly to that little building. And when you gave out a hymn, you couldn't sing it out loud. You just have to lip sync it. You just have to mouth the words because you wouldn't want anyone to hear you. So church order is not what goes on in the building. So suppose I go and I'm visiting this little group. They're meeting in a house. As soon as we arrive, say on the Wednesday night for a prayer meeting or a Bible study, as soon as we arrive, the brother who owns the house hands it over as a stewardship to the assembly. An hour before, he could say, Nicholson, I don't want you here. He had every right to say that. It was his house. But now, it's none of his business. The elders make that decision. And if, if he doesn't, can't deal with that, then they better meet somewhere else. Maybe that was Diotrephes. Maybe he owned the house. So it's now the elders' responsibility. And when the people arrive, the men are to be uncovered. 
They are to be ready to speak as a representative of God as the Spirit leads. The women are to be covered, and they are not to speak representatively, although their spirits are ready to worship the Lord, to praise Him, to pray, and so on. So church order is in effect. The next evening, I'm staying in the house, say, and the couple say, um, let's have the Christians over tonight for some fellowship. The same group shows up. It's the same real estate, same furniture, maybe even the same topic of discussion. And someone says, about what you were saying last night, and we begin to discuss the scriptures. There's, it's not that there's no order. There's home order. This is the exercise of the heart of the Christians. They are showing hospitality to the saints. They have welcomed them into their house. And now it's home order. The sisters are going to be marked by the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. They're not going to embarrass their husbands. They're not going to dominate the conversation. But they are free to ask their questions in home order. And I think if we had more of this where the sisters could ask their questions because sometimes they're single or their husbands are not saved or their husbands are not spiritually interested, they need answers to their spiritual questions. And we need to provide that environment. It would relieve the pressure on the local church sometimes to provide that kind of environment if we were doing it in home order. So it's a different order. It's not that there's no order. The day before, if something went wrong, the elders would be held accountable. But today, if something goes wrong, the husband is held accountable as the head of the home. So that's really the question. Who is accountable? If, if the answer is the elders of the local assembly, then it's church order with certain limitations. We recognized earlier that sometimes uh, church business has to be carried on, but not in church order. For example, if a couple's having marital problems, the elders meet with them. It, the whole church is not welcome. It's a private matter, and the sister would certainly be free to say whatever she wanted to say, right? So uh, there are meetings that relate to the church that are not necessarily church meetings in that sense, where you have uh, elders' meetings. The whole church is not expected to come. So there are particular meetings we noticed in Acts 2.42, that are the responsibility, the mandate of the elders to, to pro provide for the people of God in these distinct ways. Those are the meetings of the church. But there are other gatherings of the Lord's people that have to do with outreach. There are ladies' meetings. There are Sunday school work. There are all sorts of other meetings. They are not technically meetings where the church is welcome. If you brethren showed up at a ladies' meeting, believe me, you would be unwelcome. That, that's not the purpose of them. So when we're talking about church order, we're talking about the elders accountable, fulfilling their mandate to provide these four basic reasons for gathering. And there are other events where Christians gather together. It's, it's home order. It's not church order. Now, God wants someone accountable. It's not a matter of, of doing things out of order and having no one accountable. God wants someone to be accountable for what goes on. And so it's important that we be in one of those orders whenever we're involved in the things of God. Now I'm going to leave that subject because we're getting well on in our time. And there may be some of you who have some questions about that and you know where the question box is. And I leave that to you. God has designed responsibilities for both the man and the woman. And we have uh, quite a list here on pages 38 and 39 of the responsibilities and the privileges of service for the man and the woman. Unfortunately, in the history of the church, especially those who, who say with some fervor that they follow the New Testament pattern, there has been a great deal of talk about what the women can't do. We're quite good at that. We know that very well. We hear it at many, many conferences. And what we need to do is think about what the women can do because the New Testament is chock full of opportunities for the sisters to be actively engaged in the work of God. Every sister, as we noticed earlier, is gifted. Every sister has a gift. And every sister is intended to use her gift in a ministry which the Lord Jesus gives her. 
So when elders don't want the sisters to do very much, they are coming up against some formidable wall, aren't they? That, that the Holy Spirit of God has gifted the sisters and that the Lord Jesus has called them to a ministry, woe betides the elders, who squelch what God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are trying to do in the church. It's a very important principle, isn't it? I mentioned in this uh, introductory paragraph that um, because of the way people have misconstrued Christendom, we sometimes get the charge that, that the Bible is uh, chauvinistic and that Paul was a male chauvinist who was against women. Nothing could be further from the truth. Anyone who reads the epistles of Paul finds him constantly attributing, expressing thanks and appreciation for the sisters who were fellow workers with him in the gospel. And he speaks very highly of many of these sisters. He speaks of Phoebe. He speaks of, of others who, who have contributed. Mary, who was a mo like a mother to him. And others who have been doing a work for God. So here we have um, the woman as a role model to younger women. And this is so important. And I understand there are problems here because my mother's generation, she's 80 uh, next week, uh, they grew up, they were very private, they were very discreet. And uh, so to sit down with a younger woman and to talk about some of the issues that a younger woman might want to talk about uh, relative to um, uh, her own personal godliness and uh, her relationship with her husband and the problems that she may be having, it's a hard thing for older women to do, but it's got to be done. Sisters, the families are falling apart. And you have a strategic role to play in helping young mothers, young wives, cope with the tremendous pressures at the present time. It's, it's absolutely essential. The elders can't do it. They're not cut out for it. They're not designed for it. And the scripture enjoins you, let the older women teach the younger women how to be sober, that is to be serious about things, how to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. In other words, the older women, having learned from the Lord the secret, the strategic role of happy submission, your submission is as strategic as Christ's submission to God in accomplishing his will on earth. And there's something beautiful and something effective, something, something dynamic about a sister who has discovered this principle. I remember reading uh, a letter written by a mother to her daughter during the days of the suffragette movement when women were trying to get the vote. And she wrote to her daughter, my dear, for centuries women have had the inestimable privilege of watching the sovereignty of God overcome the stupidity of man. And you know, it's a wonderful thing for sisters to realize that they, they are not shut up to their own resources. They don't have to push their way. They have a direct line to heaven, and God takes us seriously when we take him seriously. And that's the whole point, that Sarah called Abraham Lord in her heart. In other words, she recognized his God-given position in the divine order, and she was not confounded. She was not shocked when he failed, God didn't fail. We see it in, in Egypt, we see it again in um, in Gerar, that when, when Abraham failed his wife, he should have been there. He didn't protect her. He wasn't there for her. God stepped in, and he was there for her. And so it's a wonderful opportunity for sisters to, to prove God in the daily experiences of life and for older sisters to explain to young wives who are frustrated, perhaps by failing husbands, husbands who aren't what they ought to be, for an older sister to encourage them to trust in God and to watch God work in the lives of their husbands and to pray them through it. It's a tremendous and necessary function of women. And then secondly, as a doer of good works, we see this, and we've talked about this earlier, the strategic role of good works as a handmaiden to the gospel. And we need to get back to that. We need to see good works happening in the community. And I've talked about places where I've gone for gospel efforts, 
and most of the unsaved have been brought along by a few women who are doers of good in the community. And when it's time for a gospel effort, they have an influence in the lives of people that other people don't have. Owe no man anything but to love one another. If I love you, you owe me. And the, and the gospel is greatly helped by the winsome influence of those who are doers of good works in the community. And then number three, as being saved through childbearing. Interesting phrase. We have it in 1 Timothy 2.15. The idea being that mothers raise children for God. That's their business, to raise children for God, more important than the President of the United States. And Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel 2 describes the strategic role of women who raise children for God. Now, because we now belong to two families, we have our own family, but we also have the family of God, there are women who in the sovereign purposes of God, are not given physical children of their own. And I have met some of these, sometimes referred to as mothers in Israel, who then say, if this is the will of God, then I will be a mother to all those who are motherless. And what a wonderful ministry they have. I think of a couple in Windsor, Ontario, Mr. and Mrs. Vic Sammons. They have no children of their own. And so that's what they determined to do. They built a room down the side of their house. It's quite a long room. It has a big table and chairs around it. And every Sunday at lunch, they invite all of the international students and the Christian young people who have no place to go, whose parents are not saved. And, and they come together and they sit around that table, maybe 35 or 40. The last time I was there, after the meal, I was asked to give a word in the gospel, which is standard every week. And uh, there were some uh, Hindus from India, there were some Muslims from Jordan, there were some communist Chinese sitting around that table listening to the gospel. And this couple has spiritual children all over the world. It's not easy if you long to have children and the Lord doesn't give you children. I happen to know because, well, my daughter is in that situation. And it's marvelous to see the grace of God at work in her heart. She spends a lot of her time helping a young lady who has two children and then had triplets. <laughs> and so she's over there looking after someone else's children. Now you need the grace of God to do that when you long to have your own. But God is able to strategically use you. Let's never forget, ladies and gentlemen, that our earthly families are only for time. When we get to heaven, we'll be in one big family. And we need to realize the strategic role that sisters can play in this matter of childbearing and caring for, ch for motherless children. Number four, as the keeper of the home. The word keep is an old English word that refers to the drawbridge into a castle. And the keeper was the one who controlled the drawbridge. And so the mother has been given the strategic role in the home to control the things that come in and out of the family, out of the home. The, uh, the magazines that we read, the things we watch, the children, the friends of our children. The, the mother is there, and she's to look after them. Now, woe betides the mother who's AWOL, who's not there to protect the home. Now, when it says a keeper of the home, it doesn't mean kept at home. It doesn't mean chain her in the basement and throw her a piece of raw meat once in a while. The keeper of the home is not kept at home. Please notice, when my wife is driving down the road in our minivan with the children in the back going to visit some old folks and taking them some cookies, she's the keeper of the home. That's the home. The home is not the house. The home is the family. And she's as much a keeper of the home when she's driving along in the car, maybe singing choruses or memorizing Bible verses in the van, as she is when she's sitting in the house. She's the keeper of the home. She's been given a special role. As the elders are the keepers of the assembly to protect what comes in and goes out, so these women are the keepers of the home. And then as the purveyors of private instruction. We need to see this, don't we? Aquila and Priscilla sense in the ministry of the young Apollos something isn't quite right. They invite him to their home. 
Better than a brother nailing him to the wall at the back of the meeting hall after he speaks and uh, laying him in lavender in front of everyone else. They were a little more discreet in those days, and they thought it would be a good thing to have him over for a little cup of tea. And as they sat in their home, both Aquila and Priscilla discussed the scriptures with him. That's a beautiful thing, you know. I thank God for my wife and for her godly influence and for her study of the scriptures. She can put a lot of brethren to shame. Dear brethren, if we're going to get up and minister the word of God, let's do it right. There are many sisters who suffer through pathetic, half-baked ministry, and they could blow your socks off with what they know of the word of God. Shame on us. If we get up there and stumble around because we didn't spend the time to get a word from God. So the sisters do have absolute freedom in the home. Is this shocking? I hope not. They have absolute freedom in the home. As we open up the scriptures in the home, the sisters have absolute freedom to discuss the scriptures in home order. Otherwise, we go back to Judaism where the men, you know, the men kept it to themselves and the, the ladies couldn't even look at the scriptures. That's how it is with the Muslims. That's how it is with the Jews. That's not how it is with the Christians. There's neither male nor female, neither bond nor free, neither Jew nor Gentile. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't order. Obviously, if a Christian father and a Christian son got saved, the father was still the father and the son was still the son. The husband and the wife are still husband and wife. But there is tremendous liberty in the life of the church. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And to invite people into our home, young people, and to discuss the scripture with them, it's a tremendous thing. It's, it's so uh, strengthening and encouraging to the hearts of God's people. Again, I, I have been in situations where somehow they feel all the teaching has to go on in the building. You know, there are some people, you may have heard of them, and they're very quick to say, this is not the church, the building is not the church, get it out of your head, the building means nothing. But you know, the building has become to mean very much to some people. And they have this idea that all the teaching has to go on inside the building. These early Christians, everywhere they went, they were enjoying the things of God. And here's a, a classic picture of a, a brother coming into the home, the husband and wife opening the scripture and discussing not just some little devotional thought. They were getting into solid Bible doctrine. And both Aquila and Priscilla shared this together. In fact, there are six references to Aquila and Priscilla in the New Testament, and every time the names are flipped. Once it's Priscilla and Aquila, then Aquila and Priscilla, Priscilla, so they get equal billing. <laughs> they, were, they were companions in labor. They shared together in the things of God. As servants of the Lord, everyone gifted, you remember? And we have some classic examples listed for you here, those who serve the Lord. And then as gospel witnesses, those women which labored with me in the gospel. Let's remember that in the Middle East situation, no man could walk up to a woman and speak to her about the Lord. It is far better for women to reach women with the gospel than for men to try and do it. It's, it's not a good order. And the women have wonderful ways of reaching out to women to have coffee in their home, invite them in uh, for a little Bible study. Um, I, some of you have heard me say that my wife is a basket case. Uh, every once in a while, she'd take a wicker basket and she'd put in it a nice gingham cloth and some flowers and a, a thermos of tea and some cookies and her Bible. And uh, she would call up one of the neighbors and say, I'd like to come over for tea. Don't get anything ready. I've got everything. And she would bring it in and she'd lay it all out, including her Bible. And uh, they'd sit down together and she'd say, listen, I was reading this. You'll, you'll really appreciate this. I was reading this just the other day. I, th I thought of you. I thought this would be an encouragement to you. And she'd read a little scripture to them. And she'd have an opportunity in the gospel. And eventually my wife was able, they had a coffee hour at our assembly. She was able to bring almost the whole street with her because she was willing to go into the home and open up the word of God with them. We need to do this. I mean, our neighbors around us are going to hell. 
And we need, to, we need to be winsome. We need to find ways to invite them in into, under the sound of the gospel. Most of them will be highly intimidated to come out to hear the gospel preached, especially if their husbands are resistant. And so here's a way to invite the ladies in to hear the word of God. And this is what the early Christians did. They were involved in this sort of thing. And the ladies were very much involved in the gospel work as examples of holy living. And I make some suggestions here. Uh, the, uh, I, I heard just recently uh, someone was getting excited about uh, the women's liberation movement and said, you know, wherever you see trouble in the church, find the woman. Well, you know what? It's probably true that wherever you find a great tragedy in the Bible, you'll find a woman behind it. But wherever you find great blessing, you'll always find a woman behind it. And when I see that the men all forsook him and fled, the women were last at the cross and first at the tomb, I salute them and say three cheers for the women. There's been many an assembly where the brethren have failed. They've made a mess of things, and the sisters have prayed the assembly through some of the darkest days in their history and laid hold of God. And largely the unity, the strength of the assemblies in the hands of the men and the quality of their teaching and spiritual leadership, but the unity and the happiness of the assembly is in the hands of the women. It is a very strategic role they have to play in the life of the church. As sufferers for Christ's sake, I've, I've told you stories about women around the world. The enemy is not fussy. He'll go after the women as soon as the men. And many dear sisters have suffered tremendously. And there are women in this country who suffer. They suffer with children who are wayward, with husbands who are cold at heart and carnal. They come into the assembly and they put on their Sunday suit and their big smile and everybody thinks it's okay. And the wives are home suffering. Oh, dear sister, may you be encouraged. The Lord is standing by. He knows what you're going through. He hasn't asked you to do something he hasn't done himself. The Lord Jesus humbled himself and submitted himself and became obedient. And he knows what he's asking you to do. And so be encouraged that weeping endures for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And then as worshipers, <laughs> I think I've mentioned that uh, sometimes, uh, almost every year, we get a few letters written to us about including women's worshipful comments on the Choice Gleanings calendar. And I write back and say as respectfully as I can, um, do you use a hymn book that doesn't have any ladies' hymns in it? What would we do without Annie, Fanny, and Franny? Annie Johnson Flitton and Francis Rivley Havergal and, and uh, Fanny Crosby. What would we do without so many of these Anne Ross cousins? Our hymn books are full. That's not just our hymn books, our Bibles. Are you going to take out Hannah's Prayer and Mary's Magnificat? Are you going to take out some of these beautiful expressions of praise and worship in the... In, uh, Listen, brothers and sisters, we are worshipers together. It's not a matter of the sister taking leadership in the church or leading in worship. Of course not. But the sisters are worshipers as much as the men are worshipers. And our, our, their hearts rise up in praise and adoration to him. Well, I, I don't want to go lightly on the men. <laughs> uh, but usually when we speak about the women, we're always sort of giving it to them, you see. Um, and telling them what they shouldn't do. So that's why I've wanted to spend the bulk of the evening uh, describing some of the beautiful ministries that are given to the women. But I would say this, that much of the pressure for women to move into leadership is because of the failure of men to take their responsibility seriously. We put it on the women, but brethren, if, if, if men were servant leaders as our Lord Jesus is, the well, sisters would, would be happy to follow in that spiritual guidance. They would be happy to have men who are men of God, who have that combination of strength, spiritual strength, and spiritual tenderness that comes by
by knowing Christ, because that's exactly what he's like. But I leave this with you. Um, our responsibility to function as the image and glory of God, to be holy and royal priests, along with the sisters. Uh, if it's wrong for the woman to stand and speak representatively, how terribly wrong is it for the man not to stand and speak when the Spirit of God calls him to do it? The one is more obvious to us. I think the other one is more damaging to the glory of the Lord. Would a man rob God? I'm afraid sometimes we do. And so we need to be ready to do our part. Every man gifted by the Spirit, people say, well, he's really gifted. You know, we're all really gifted. And when you say gift, there's nothing to be proud of here. Gift is a bit of a clue that I had nothing to do with it. It's a gift. And we all are gifted and expected to use our gift. Every, one, uh, every man a suppliant and intercessor. Some men elders, all are to be followers. Follow me, says Paul, as I follow Christ. Men as evangelists, but all to be witnesses. Certain evangelists, but all witnesses. Certain men gifted teachers, but all are to be students of the word of God. Now that was very hurried, and I know I've left large gaps, which means we'll have some really good questions in part two. All right? We'll just close with a word of prayer. Our Father, as we have been thinking of man-woman order in the church, we thank thee that behind it is the beautiful love story of one who loved and lost a while and came wooing back that which he had lost. Oh, Father, is it really true that we shall be the eternal companions of thy blessed Son, the object of his care and kindness and compassion? And so shall we ever be with the Lord. We thank thee, O oh God, that we who are sinners of the Gentiles, far from God, without hope, have been made so near that he would speak of us as bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, that we should be recipients of the very life of Christ, one with him forever. Help us then to mirror our solemn responsibilities as the lover and the loved one, in the home and in the church, that men and women who see us will see behind it the greater love story of a Savior who woos them to and wants them to join him in that beautiful company, the king's daughter, all glorious within, a bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. We ask it in the Savior's name.